Jeff, and today we're going to talk about how we onboard the next billion into Ethereum, and not only that, empower them to access more financial freedom using DeFi as a substrate to do that. So before I begin, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the fellowship program. So the EF fellowship program was started, uh, this is the second cohort right now, and we are 12. So everyone working from giving farmers last mile access to insurance in Africa, through to uh, education in Syria with Karam. Uh, we have some folks from Giga that are providing internet access to schools around the world. The EF Fellowship Program is an incredible space and opportunity uh, for people to think about what is the role of Ethereum in the global south and what impact can we have in these spaces and communities. So if you're interested in learning more, I'll give you a bit of a, a rundown on how one can get involved with the EF's Next Billion team. But the project that I'm working on is seeking to address a social crisis. So in Guatemala, which is where I'm from, we have over two million people that live in really inadequate housing. So you might, what comes into mind perhaps might be something analogous to say the favelas uh, in Brazil. It's oftentimes really, really uh, poor housing conditions that people find themselves in. So we take them from living in these conditions here to much more improved uh, housing conditions through a project called Lamina Pop. Lamina Pop is working with some really amazing partners um, and functionally what we're doing is thinking of ways to uh, rebuild new housing for disenfranchised communities. That's all well and good. However, um, I will tell you a little bit about sort of the, the why this matters massively for folks, right? So we can build houses for 30% cheaper than leading low-cost housing solutions in a fraction of time. So within three to four days, we can get a house propped up and the buildings that we build are prefabricated so we can ship them anywhere. Uh, which, if you've ever carried more than two concrete blocks, you'll understand this actually makes a huge difference uh, when building last mile housing. The problem, however, is that in order for people to access housing right here in the States, you can get a mortgage for 5 4%. I mean, you know, with interest rates going up, these things are changing a little bit. But really, the idea is that you can access low-cost uh, financing for your house with the traditional financial institutions. In Latin America, in Guatemala, this isn't the case. So we have these uh, incumbent traditional financial institutions that are systematically set up to keep people poor and not necessarily give them access to better financial services. Now, interestingly enough, in comes DeFi. You can get a low interest rate loan in DeFi, granted it's over collateralized and we're gonna dive into the implications of that. But I mean, you can even on liquidity get a 0% interest rate loan um, and, and the question is like, what is it gonna take for us to bring these interest rates uh, and the access to DeFi, which is really amazing, to last mile communities? So how have we been exploring this and why does this matter? So we're already seeing a barrage of regulatory uh, attacks coming into the crypto ecosystem. Granted, much of it is to some extent like well-deserved, right? It's not that um, a lot of the sort of crypto ecosystem did have some bad blood in it, so building more resilient, anti-fragile regulatory frameworks for us to say, hey, look, we aren't just building these Ponzi schemes, we're actually driving more value to last mile communities is crucial. Moreover, right now we aren't, uh, a lot of this map here shows you the areas where crypto has a fully established regulatory framework. The areas in green is where we're already seeing more clarity emerge in the ecosystem. But if you look at the areas in red, yellow, and gray, Functionally, that means we don't have that much uh, regulation that has fully been established yet. So the question is, how can we, through thought processes of bringing last mile DeFi to people around the world, also influence governments in what is primarily the global south to take more crypto-friendly approaches? While doing that, as we bring people up, we're going to grow this ecosystem. We're going to become much stronger. We're going to take all of the lessons that we have uh, from deploying last mile solutions and say, hey, this is the relevance for you know, account abstraction and MPC. So we have so many lessons to take along the way as we begin to deploy more and more of these solutions. And obviously, the impact of giving people access to last mile financing and drastically improving their lives is huge. So the research itself, what I've been doing is I've been speaking with hundreds of folks across the ecosystem from universities, leading DeFi protocols, uh, researchers, developers, creators, so on and so forth, and asking them, listen, what's it gonna take for us to bring DeFi to the masses, right? Another really awesome, and some of you in this audience may have even participated with this, 
uh, what I've been doing is I've been crowdsourcing information using social media, which has been awesome. So I published this uh, graph, and this is the first version. You're going to see the full version in just a moment. And I said, hey, guys, these are my thoughts so far on how we bring Last Mile DeFi to communities in Latin America. What do you guys think? And I had a bunch of responses. So whether that was James from the EF saying, hey, you should move account abstraction at the wallet layer, uh, Nikhil from Celo thinking about underwriting and how we can create more robust underwriting practices in the DeFi ecosystem, or a friend from Guatemala mentioning the importance of off-ramps, right? So what we ended up with is this massive map. And this is part one, by the way. So this speaks a little bit more to uh, the entrance of what it will ultimately take for a last mile. Uh, this is all on Twitter, by the way. So, um, and I, I'm going to share a link tree, but please feel free to take photos. Um, what, what will it ultimately take for us to get there and mapping out all of the dependencies along the way? So this is more at the sort of like infrastructure and also like individual layer, I guess one might say. So really the basics is what I call this. And then if we dive into the application layer, we can see that all of the different sort of use cases that dApps can bring to last mile communities, whether that be DeFi protocols, the role of decentralized social, as well as P2P marketplaces, uh, lending protocols, and it gets all the way down to thinking about blockchain scalability, uh, composability, and privacy. So what I'm doing at the moment is basically writing a report, and I'm going to share with you all this report. This is the first time uh, sharing version one. So. I wanted to share some lessons with you. So firstly is, let's think about the basics here. The assumption that many people have internet access is uh, one that isn't necessarily true, right? So in Latin America, more people have access to mobile phones and 90% of, of internet usage comes through mobile phones. So as we think about developing applications, let's optimize for mobile first experiences. Now that leads me to wallets. So anybody here download the Uniswap wallet yet? Um, yeah, so huge to think about. <laughs> hey, Serena. Uh, huge to think about, right? The, the, the increased adoption of mobile wallets um, and how we are continuously going to see more applications in, uh, leveraging that. So, identity and reputation, also another really fascinating area. If we think about decentralized social, for example, what, what infrastructure or what information are we building onto these social graphs? that can ultimately help us in giving more transparency to last mile communities that may not necessarily have access to other means of establishing the reputation, let's say. Um, on and off ramps, crucial. One of my favorite on and off ramps example is Coinbase. They partnered with OXO, which is a huge, huge gas station and sort of mini supermarket throughout Mexico. They provide 37,000 off ramps throughout Mexico with just, the tap of a, with just the tap of a button in an application. Incredible. Um, Fiat Connect from the Celo ecosystem also doing an amazing job of trying to create unified on and off ramp solutions. So again, all of this will be sort of further dived into into the report, but just wanted to show with you and, and share with you some sort of initial findings. Ecosystem building is huge, right? We're all here at ETH Denver establishing relationships, establishing really strong partnerships, saying, hey, we should work on this, we should work on that, creating more education for folks within the current crypto ecosystem, but also the wider ecosystem will be crucial in order to continue to develop much more anti -res or fully resilient um, relationships and community building. So that could be through events, it could be through hackathons, it could be through establishing different networks that connect with one another. Obviously, real-world assets, this is a whole sort of another uh, can, but uh, yep, shout out to uh, Credix and Centrifuge and some of the really other amazing teams that are developing a lot of uh, innovation on this front, right? So bringing real-world assets is essential. Scalability and composability, again, uh, won't necessarily dive into this, but we are so far away from being able to handle like billions of people using Ethereum today, right? So uh, putting more energy into the scalability aspect is crucial, but also composability. For the end user, it shouldn't matter if I'm using you know, one chain or another, it should all just interoperate seamlessly. And this has all been sort of the, uh, a lot of the findings that have come through over the course of this research. So uh, I'm gonna leave it here. What I have here um, is a link to my link tree. Um, you can also find my socials as well there. And just wanted to give a quick shout out to Lens Protocol and Cello who uh, are supporting this research. Please feel free to um, yeah share, share the report, version one, what I'm going to be doing over the course of the next couple of weeks. We'll be ingesting everyone's feedback on this report, generating version two, which will be much more polished, much more refined. Um, and then from that, I'll also be creating a podcast and audio visual series where we'll be speaking with a whole bunch of different people across the ecosystem. So people who are leveraging Bitcoin to bring DeFi to people. Bitcoin is huge in Latin America. So how can we bring more 
take Bitcoin adoption and integrate that with the Ethereum ecosystem potentially, um, thinking about the role of decentralized social in onboarding the masses. Gaming is another key crux here. So I wanted to leave about a few minutes to see if there were any questions from the audience as well. Um, feel free to put your hand up, speak up, and, and happy to field any questions. Or I'd love to hear from you as well. Like, What do you see as being key roadblocks to mass adoption in crypto today, specifically DeFi? So thank you. Hi, um, Marcus. I, I, have you talked with government representatives and what is their point of view? Is if, if so, with, with, sorry, with what representatives? Uh, governments. Yeah. Government. So that is really interesting. That's why I showed this map at the start, where a lot of regulation is still somewhat in the works. Oftentimes, the case in Latin America, unless you have a purely like strong anti-crypto stance, as is the case in say Bolivia. Generally, there is uh, a bit of ignorance as far as the extent to which crypto could and how it should be regulated. And that's where I feel we have a really strong opportunity here. So crypto has its strongest product market fit in the global south, in Latin America. So if we can show regulators, hey, we are building this, and this, this system that allows us to provide a lot of value to some of the poorest people in your country, ultimately, with that, you know, we can build these super pro um, friendly regulatory environments. So I know you had a question up here as well. Yeah. My question is related with the last one is like basically how are you approaching to the governments uh, in, in Latin America? I'm from Colombia and, and I know in basically in all Latin America we are struggling with different kind of coins or trying to access our financial systems and how the ETH Foundation is trying to approach its government because some governments, I don't know, bureaucracy, plutocracy, and yeah, you know, how is Latin America then? I would like to know more about that. Yeah, so for those of you that aren't from Latin America, one of the things that is a massive, massive chokehold for us is every four years, uh, it's, it's, it's different to how a lot of uh, government regulation works here in the States. Every four years, the entire... Uh, cabinet and uh, administ uh, officers of the administration get completely changed. So there is no continuity from one government to the next in a lot of Latin American countries. So that, that creates a really tough environment to think about how we regulate this. I think ultimately it's about encoding things in law, um, in, in national law, right, and saying, hey, we want to really sort of establish um, these things that you can't necessarily walk back at some point or it would be hard to do so. Uh, as far as the, the EF's Next Billion team and how they engage with uh, governments, there's obviously a lot of open conversation um, that they're sharing and, and having with those folks as well. Yeah. Can you tell me more about the uh, off-ramp of the OXO in Mexico? It's just a massive need. Is that currently working? And what level can you open up on that? I, I don't know, like, stats-wise how it's going. But again, the way it works is um, you have your Coinbase wallet and... If someone from Mexico has ever used the OXO off-ramp with Coinbase, would love to hear more about that. But functionally, the way that it works is you have your wallet and you can send it to a, you know, you go into an OXO, you send it to a certain address, or even in your Coinbase wallet, I think it just says, like, cash out at OXO. You show it to the cashier, and then, boom, you walk out. The other really, just on the off-ramps piece, ATMs are amazing as well. Like, Bitcoin ATMs that functionally enable, like, peer-to-peer -peer exchanges without having to meet at the same, you know, time uh, is... Awesome. Uh, I've seen, but there's one in Guatemala that gets a ton of use case, uh, usage, and uh, I'm a big fan of that. So, hey, Deepa, nice yeah, to see you. Yeah, hi. Uh, I feel like Bitcoin is really far ahead when it comes to, uh, you know, Global South. Uh, there, there are these missionaries who go there and really try to spread the word and try to set up circular economies too. You know, like, you don't have to ever off-ramp. You can just stay within the system. And uh, so I feel like... Um, there are a number of things that can really help uh, DeFi reach uh, the, you know, for financial inclusion. One is obviously most of the global south is mobile, like they barely use laptops. So the ease of transaction and convenience on mobile. Education hubs will be great, like just getting them to hands-on experience using crypto wallets and stuff like that. Like that's completely lacking. So maybe like a DAO kind of a structure at a very community level, you know, just capacity building and educating them on using and transacting and also clarifying misinformation because there's tons of misinformation, right? 
and mainstream always carries them in, you know, like the, the scam stories. So how do we clarify that? And I think that Education Hub can serve a lot of purpose, you know, just very DAO level structures at the community level. For sure, yeah, I think education is key. People are surprised, like, how much Bitcoin is used in Latin America. We have these, I think it's a consequence of having these use, uh, instances in our history where people feel a high degree of, like, resistance to any form of, like, corruption. Um, and so Bitcoin generally is seen as like the most decentralized network and therefore people are very inclined to use um, Bitcoin and the Lightning Network and the RSK Network as well. So um, that, that's an interesting take and, and it's something to sort of ponder particularly in sort of these um, obviously Ethereum heavy uh, ecosystems. So, you know, I, again, I think ultimately it shouldn't necessarily matter um, I, as an end user, you know, the, the, the interface should be as seamless as logging into your banking app. So, hi, Mila. Um, Latin America is a very diverse space, right? But do you think relevant, do you think it is relevant for us to think this as LATAM, like even considering the language differences, do you think there's a like ecosystem approach to Latin America as a whole, like considering the differences and also the language barrier that should be taken into account? Yeah, that's a good question, especially coming from a Brazilian. Um, so. That, it's a really valid point. Like, and, and I think it, this is always something I caution people when they're like, oh, I want to develop, you know, I want to launch my app in LATAM. I'm like, the situation in Honduras is completely different to what you're going to find in Venezuela. Um, but the, the way I see it is there are historical and cultural similarities, but it's certainly not the exact same carbon copy by any means, right? So if, even if we look at El Salvador, again, Obviously, very pro Bitcoin. Bukele has notoriously been known for being sort of a, a maxi in that regard. Um, that that is, there's a lot of lessons for us to take there. So I think it's not like the same strategy should be applied carte blanche across the entire region. But it's about like, hey, what can we learn uh, given we share a relatively similar set of uh, underlying sort of, uh, yeah, I guess, a landscape, right? So, yeah. But um, yeah, there's 30 seconds left. Last chance to, if you want to scan the link tree, again, you'll find sort of the socials and then also all the, all the links to the report. Obviously, there's going to be an NFT that's come, on, come along with this. Okay, it's not working, so come find me after. Um, and thank you for your time. Really appreciate it.